Um, I'm excited to chat with you guys about this because we've got some really, really amazing panel guests. Gentlemen, come on up here. So we have folks from Polygon, Ava Labs, Hedera, and Philcoin, and we're going to be asking them some maybe controversial questions. I haven't decided yet. Right I'm going to sit right here, so I'll give you this mic. Also, before we get started, big shout out to everybody who is watching this virtually in the metaverse via Binance. Make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe, set alerts, etc. So before we get started, I would love for everybody to introduce themselves, tell us where you work, what your role is about, and let's get into it. Hey everybody, my name is Ryan Kuehl. I work at Polygon Studios on the partnerships team. Um, and I manage some of our large, um, inter what we call entertainment partners. So I manage the Meta relationship, the Starbucks relationship, um, the Reddit relationship, and many others across entertainment and gaming. And I'm based in Miami, and it's great to be here today with you all. Hey everyone, John Nahas, uh, Vice President of Business Development at Ava Labs, supporting the Avalanche blockchain. Uh, I oversee growth uh, in three main focus points, uh, wallets, assets, and applications across six verticals. So from your most traditional TradFi institutional capital markets, enterprises, exchanges and wallets, DeFi, NFTs, and gaming. Um, I'm based in Los Angeles, been, been with Ava Labs for a little over two years since mainnet, so, yeah. Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining today. My name is Brady Gentile. Uh, I work at Swirls Labs in support of the Hedera Network. Uh, I'm a director of marketing uh, with a focus on Web3 ecosystems uh, on Hedera, and I'm based in New York, and excited to share a little bit about what we do today. Hi everyone, I'm Danston. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Philcoin. Um, yeah, so this is one of my portfolios, uh, and yeah, my main focus is on business development and working with governments and regulators. Amazing, okay. Should I start with the hard questions or the fun questions first? <laughs> We'll start with an easy one. Um, so how do each of you gentlemen see gaming projects incorporating blockchain technology, especially NFTs? Because I feel like every single project up here is affiliated with something along the lines of this. Sure. So, I mean, a lot of people talk about digital property rights within games. You can buy and own the assets, and that's great. And there are a lot of games that we work with that are doing that. Um, one area of development within gaming that I'm very excited about is what I would call the tournament layer. So this is really from the perspective of the gamer, the ability to play with gamers who have more streamers and maybe play in um, gaming tournaments that have larger prize pools. So when you win a game, you get an NFT. It's not so much with an in-game asset, but this is an NFT that represents a trophy. And they can use that for token-gated access um, to games or to tournaments that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get into. So if you're a gamer, maybe you're a Twitch streamer, maybe you're a YouTube gamer, um, you're trying to build up your following and build up your branded content media business, um, the ability to play with other gamers that have large followings represents a significant opportunity for you to increase your following and increase your distribution. Um, so the ability for tournaments connected to token-gated experiences and to build that as a tournament layer across many different games I think is really interesting. Um, it's not to say that your PFP you know, maybe it won't be, you won't be able to use, you know, the PFP you bought within a certain game. There's a lot of really cool use cases for that as well. But I'm just particularly excited about the ability to help people grow their media businesses um, through the token gated access element. So, I mean, taking a step back, right, looking at gaming as a whole, I think has the largest opportunity to bring the most amount of new users into Web3, right? We're talking about mass adoption of Web3 here. Uh, you know, these are mostly men, 18 to 35, but gamers are very connected to their ecosystems and the things that they do, right? So whether it's in-game assets, loyalty, NFTs, there's a million ways in which to unlock things that previously weren't there, right? We've seen pay to play, we used to, where we used to buy games, and then it became, you know, free to play, and then play to earn. And I think what we're gonna start to see is kind of free to play to earn. Um, where, where things build upon each other. So the game developer has a Web3 component where people can start to build on top of games. I mean, on Avalanche, we have uh, some AAA games, such as Shrapnel, uh, Ascenders, and many others coming out, particularly on our subnets, which are you know, app-specific chains. The benefit there is, you know, 
most times what we've seen, at least in what the studies have shown, is gamers don't care about blockchain as much or crypto, right? I don't want to say they don't care, but they're gamers first, right? And crypto people tend to do a thing where they build things for crypto people, right? We build crypto apps for crypto people who speak in crypto language, and it's very exclusive, and it's not, it's not, you're not bringing more people in. So with gamers, first and foremost, you have to build something that they want, something that'll make their lives or games better and easier. And then if there's a way for them to kind of peel into a larger ecosystem, I think that's better. But I think gaming on the whole, whether it's gaming or even like something like payments, right? Um, if you use Venmo or PayPal, you don't care if that app is using ACH or Fedwire or SIFA in the background. You just know that you're clicking a button and your mo money is moving faster, easier. We need to build the same functionality. And I think Web3 Gaming started off with your kind of play to earn and it's growing. And as time goes on, I think with more developers, and some really cool things coming up in this space, you'll see much, much more adoption and much more innovation across the board. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna echo what John has said in regards to uh, mainstream adoption of gaming. Yes, there's Web3 Gaming. They focused on blockchain first and uh, NFTs and assets first, and that was great for the crypto communities, but it wasn't really attractive at all, and if anything, um, you know, drove real gamers away from it because of the number of scams and rug pulls and everything else that they see in the space. And when it comes to adoption by sort of AAA games, um, as, as John mentioned, it's behind the scenes. Like no one cares uh, sort of what backend infrastructure is used, what database is used for, you know, Medal of Honor, for example. Um, they just care that it works. They care that the experience is great. If you look at the way that players are uh, using assets in games today, there's a Steam store that has just lists and lists and lists of assets that are for sale for in-game items, and it looks like an NFT marketplace, but it's not NFTs. And I'd almost love to see a gaming company decide to use blockchain on the back end, give players that amazing experience, not even tell them it's blockchain, and then come out later and be like, oh yeah, by the way, that's blockchain. Like, I think that would actually be you know, they, they would start to realize, oh, there's actually value in this. Um, you know, yeah, I get it. And so, you know, excited to see very, very much so AAA gaming start to adopt this. That market, I think, is the largest. It touches the most number of people. Um, and, and they honestly shouldn't even really have to know that they're using blockchain on the back end. Yeah, so gamers, hackers, and coders were the early adopters of the blockchain technology of Bitcoin and so on. Um, but, you know, foremost, I started off as a professional gamer and been playing, like, been, been part of, like, World Cyber Games and so on. Representing gamers itself, most gamers would actually like to have fun games. Like, the early blockchain games were horrible. But it doesn't mean, you know, I don't invest in them, I'm not part of them, and so on. So what we are going to look at for gamers is that at the end of the day, we need games that are fun. We need games, however, many gamers also like the community uh, of the games that they play. Like, I used to play a lot of World of Warcraft, and the reason why I'm in was because of the community, the people there. We're all having fun together. So crypto is interesting because just like games, there's a community. But there's a current problem right now. Most crypto communities are very caustic. They are toxic. And why they are so is because all they are looking at is how much my NFT would gain in value. But what they should be looking at is why not we help some of these games that we are, NFT games that we are in, help them form partnerships with the networks that we are in so that the NFTs can become interoperable between different games. I think that, that is something that I'm excited about. Yeah, just, just to, uh, one of the common criticisms you see is that, you know, gamer, like there are those, you'll see this in the media, gamers, you know, hate NFTs or something to that effect. There'll be some, you know, post about that. And our CEO of Polygon Studios, Ryan Wyatt, actually stood up um, the gaming vertical at YouTube before anyone believed that would be a huge part of their advertising business, a huge part of their creator business. And you know, when he had initially joined, he did an interview on Bakelist that I thought was really insightful because you saw a very similar criticism of mobile gaming. People were saying, that's not real gaming. You know, mobile gaming isn't real gaming. There has to be great graphics. There has to be this and that. I think fundamental, I mean, 
I, I'm excited about the tournament later, but to get back to the fundamentals of what we need and what I'm seeing in terms of a thousand seeds being planted, um, and what we're seeing, what I'm seeing, the kind of on the front lines at Polygon, is game developers just trying to create great game loops and like focus less on the financialization. Once you have like a great gaming loop, people will be interested in living in an experience in the game, and then you can ha then people will be interested in the NFTs there. So one, and there's that's like more of an art than a science. So once we get that down, and there, you, so many games have been funded. You look at the sensor tower data um, of the billions of dollars that are spent in in-game purchases, but without blockchain, I think it stands to reason that there's going to be. That I'm still very bullish on on gaming. Despite that, I think it will be very similar to the mobile gaming. Will you'll have a couple big winners, and that will start to bring mass adoption. I think you can start to expect to see that um, over time. Before we talk a little bit about interoperability, I just wanted to chime in and say that mobile gaming is very important, very, very important, because when you look at the masses, like me, for example, I'm a mom. I don't have time to hop on and play any type of video games, but I do have time when I'm at the nail salon to hop on my cell phone and play a game of Bejeweled or whatever that may be. So when we're talking about adoption, mobile gaming is just as important as PC gaming, et cetera. But I do want to talk about interoperability. How are we going to be able to build connected systems and not have too many vulnerabilities. We've had so many bridge hacks that have happened across so many different chains, and it's gonna be important for interoperability, especially when you're talking about building communities, because I wanna play on your chain, but I also like the game that's on your chain, but I like the in-game items that's on your chain. How can we bring this together in a secure way to where the average person like myself that's not super tech savvy is gonna feel comfortable playing but not know that I'm using the blockchain? Yeah, and I'll admit this is you know a super important question. It's outside of my um, immediate expertise, but from my understanding, it is important to increase the the validator set um, that's involved in this. And um, I've I've heard more that, that and that's some, like some of the conversations I've had with our engineering team um, around this issue. But a little bit outside of my expertise, I'd be curious to hear from the rest of the panel. I mean, I think what we've seen repeatedly. Uh, is a failure of security and decentralization, um, right? A lot of these bridges rely on multi-sigs with a couple people that are in charge. You know, a couple multi, couple people could 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 take down the whole thing. Uh, secondly, we they we continue, or people in the space continue to reuse the same kind of architecture because it's easy to mint and burn, mint on one chain and burn on the other, or lock or whatever. Um, thankfully, on the Avalanche side, you know, we've had the Avalanche bridge now for a while, and it's been coming along uh, with Ethereum and now with Bitcoin as well. Uh, and it uses a completely different technology. So we use uh, an SGX Enclave technology. A lot of it is done off chain. Um, we have wardens that are trusted parties. It, so the, the thing is decentralized, but it also just uses a completely different paradigm than what's being done currently on chain. But I will say, I think what matters, right, is we all believe, or we should believe in a multi-chain world. Uh, because no single chain is ever gonna be able to handle everything. Uh, whoever tells you that is completely just gaslighting you. Uh, that's what maxis say because they're fighting over crumbs rather than looking at the larger pie. But the benefit on the avalanche side is, you know, I think, first of all, Polygon and us share this. You know, we, we have a focus primarily on, on the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine, right? That's kind of become the standard for smart contracts. Other chains use other, uh, other VMs. But with avalanche, the notion of subnets is you could deploy your own VM. It could be an EVM, it could be a Rust VM, it could be any kind of VM. And within the Avalanche ecosystem, we're coming up with something um, called trustless messaging where you can message amongst all of these different chains, right? So you can have an Avalanche ecosystem that could have 50, 100, 200 chains with different virtual machines, different use cases, different assets, different asset types that all communicate within that kind of uh, network with itself. Outside of the ecosystem, of course, we're gonna continually, I think, build better systems, more secure systems. I think we're still pretty early still. Uh, bridges in general are early, and for something that is so early, I think they have been transacting hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. Usually when things start off so, so small or something so new, not so much value is put on it until it's been tested out, but this industry does you know, ascribe to the move fast and break things, and there's rugs, and there's a million issues, and, and I think it hardens us but at the same time, I think the, the, the good players will rise to, to the forefront. Yeah, I think from a user perspective, the idea of assets going between different chains, that needs to be obfuscated. So from a, a UI perspective, I think it, it is a UI problem. 
and they shouldn't have to know that um, you know their asset is being migrated on the back on the back end to some other chain to allow them to take that asset into another application or another marketplace. Um, but on the back end, you know, the idea of auditability, uh, like audits on these, uh, you know, whatever development is done to create bridges is incredibly important. And then I think the space is going to evolve, to your point, um, you know, there's innovations on how these bridges are working. So um, on both Adara and uh, I believe Avalanche as well, there's a concept of state proofs. And I think state proofs are going to be a game changer in the entire space once all these different chains adopt that. Um, and allows for the type of interoperability with security that uh, the space really needs. Um, and that's it, yeah. yeah. Regarding interoperability, the main focus would be different businesses, different games working together. But actually, I, I would like everybody to see that blockchain is still a nascent tech. Um, and, and you know, we are interfacing on the back end. It's like we are looking at the codes, like even when people interface with MetaMask and so on, they are looking at block explorers, which most of the retail people don't understand. So if you want a gamer to get it, uh, we need we need like a cover on it. We need we need and we need a UI. We need an interface on top of it. So that's that's the first part. But the main focus that we are having problems now is the backend tech are not communicating with one another. Like the different blockchains, you know, even though many of them are EVM compatible, the bridges are our biggest vulnerabilities right now. So one easy way to set, set it aside would be instead of letting the asset go on bridges, we could just have wrapped assets on the other blockchain itself. And when there's a, there's a transfer, it will be a final transfer between this wallet to another of the same blockchain wallet instead of across the other blockchains. All I know is that I'm very, very excited once all systems are interoperable and I don't have to get so stressed out any time I'm doing any type of bridging because let me tell you, I know a little bit about crypto, just a little bit, and I get so nervous every single time. I want it to be like this, but I think this might be my last question. Let's talk about TPS. <laughs> Let's talk about how important that is for, e I see everybody smiling too. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about TPS. Is that a valid metric? And what are your guys' thoughts on that? Because we've heard a lot of very interesting claims from a lot of different projects boasting about their TPS, transactions per second. My chain is better, we do it better, we do it faster. But talk to us about it. Yeah, I think it's certainly an important metric, especially from user experience. We've been talking a lot about, about gaming and adoption at scale. And if you think within, within the context of a game of how quickly you'd need to transact, if, you're, you know, if you win an NFT within some sort of battle or within some sort of thing, how quickly that could ruin the user experience if it doesn't you know, reach finality. Um, I think it's also balanced with other, it needs to be contextualized with other metrics like decentralization and security, um, you know, the, the, the classic trilemma. Um, but I think all of those do should come together, um, and depending on the application um, and the use case, it's it's something certain to to dial into, but should be balanced with everything. So I'm going to take a step back to the last question real quick, because I know this panel is about mainstream adoption, and we were talking about I myself about EVM, and we we're talking about bridges, and that's not mainstream adoption, right? Like if anyone was listening from a mainstream audience to that last question set, we would have all of our answers would have failed, right? We would have all confused. Everybody and no one would have known anything. So moving on to TPS, I think it's a completely bogus uh, way to look at things. I think this industry has a problem, and it's with fluffing numbers and making up wild assumptions and assertions without them being proved. And I think as an industry, what we've seen over the past several weeks and this past year is we need to hold each other to account. And I think what's probably needed is an independent third party to create an apples to apples metric as much as possible to really say, yes, these are transactions, no, these are not, right? Um, yes, the, the, this chain can supposedly do this. You know, Avalanche boasts 4,500 transactions, Hedera boasts a lot, Polygon boasts a lot. None of us have ever reached these numbers. Let's be very clear. No one has ever come close to 1,000 transactions per second. No blockchain is doing the work that Visa is. If they tell you they are, they're lying to you. But these things get put out in the media, and mainstream media picks it up, and people hear, oh, look at this. And they confuse TPS with what's really important. 
which is finality. I can do 100,000 transactions per second, hypothetically one day, but if it takes two, five, 10 seconds to finalize, it's useless, right? I can jam so many transactions in. It doesn't matter. What matters is finality. The second the transaction hits the chain and is done. You know, I'm proud that Avalanche has the, is the fastest chain in terms of you know, finality from the second a transaction hits the chain and is not. But again, in the crypto space, we talk about crypto things to crypto people. We talk about TPS, we talk about finality, we talk about all these things that are hypotheticals. No blockchain has ever been put under the strain necessary to test any of the hypotheses and any of the assumptions that anyone has made. You know, I could say that Avalanche has unlimited trans, uh, uh, TPS because we don't have a single chain model. We have a, a horizontal scaling solution, we have multiple subnets, we could be running 10,000 blockchains each doing God knows how many t uh, transactions, right? So. I think I take it back, right? What matters is, does it work consistently? Is it secure? Has it had any issues? And is it decentralized? Because we've seen how much decentralization matters. If all those things match and all those things work, then we can start to debate who's faster, who does more transactions or not. Until then, I think we're just really going toe to toe on hypotheticals. I, I agree with John to a point. Um, TPS is not a good apples to apples comparison, but you can break out TPS into potentially more relevant uh, metrics based on the type of service that's performing the TPS. So for Hedera, for example, we have a couple native services on the network, one called the token service that does tokenization, and another called consensus service that does data writing with timestamps. And both of those services do extend to 10,000 TPS. and um, you know, we have uh, Avery Dennison, it's a mainstream large organization that has a supply chain platform called Atma.io, and they're running that supply chain platform with over three billion SKUs on Hedera using the consensus service and writing data to the ledger at incredibly high speeds for all of those uh, products and SKUs on the network. And we actually have hit 1,000 TPS as part of their process of, of backloading that and regularly see that that high transaction throughput, but um, you know, is that relevant to uh, the network effects of ecosystems that are driving TPS on a network? And I don't think it is. It doesn't. You know, that metric would require looking at maybe a daily or weekly or monthly active accounts. So there's all these different metrics that you have to look at and combine them to be able to get a more holistic view of the health of a network and the performance of a network and the ecosystems on the network. And, um, and so it's, it's important to look at these uh, sort of a bit more objectively and sort of fine-grained tuning of each one. Yeah, I think TPS is actually just a buzzword that uh, most of the early protocols, they, when they start getting investors in, when they start doing their ICOs, their raises and so on, it is a buzzword for them to get investors in. And uh, at the end of it, it's all architecture, the backend architecture of the different blockchains that are important. Like, for example, Avalanche has a good architecture for gaming companies, blockchain gaming companies itself. Uh, while there are there are ledgers out there that are good for like for like transactions across different financial institutes and such. So, at the end of the day, it's not about the TPS that's important. It's about whether or not the blockchain companies, whether or not you know the games and so on, they know which blockchain they want to work with, which are some of the infrastructures. But as what I said just now, because this industry is so nascent, many of the people that come in are startup owners. They come in not knowing anything, and many of them then come on stage claiming to be experts. Because when they claim to be experts, they get funding, right? Or that you know they build a shitty game, and then like they take some mobile game, reskin it, and then you know I'm gonna raise some funds, and now I'm a startup owner. So uh, at the end of the day, whether or not it's TPS, uh, whether or not it's the architectures that we are using, we, we we need to be a bit more honest with one another. Like even the major protocols have to be honest with like have to be honest with the projects that comes to speak to them, and to see how they are gonna work with the major protocols. Like Polygon, like like uh, Avalanche and such. 
I want to add to that too, it'd be the right tool for the right job. It's like if you have decentralized storage, the TPS isn't going to be high on that, but they're providing an incredibly valuable service for, uh, for the ecosystem at large. So, yeah. yeah, it's true. I agree. With that being said, thank you all so much for participating and answering my questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.